Today on This Week Health. Imagine this, your nurse walks into a room, he or she does a verbal assessment through this bone conducting headset that documents everything into the chart. But more than that, which seems to be table stakes these days with some of the technology, it then does decision support saying you missed a step or based off what I just heard, this is a sepsis risk, et cetera. So we're really excited about that technology, that co-development effort with a partner and where that will go. Welcome to Town Hall, a show hosted by leaders on the front lines with interviews of people making things happen in healthcare with technology. My name is Bill Russell, the creator of This Week Health, a set of channels and events dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. We've been making podcasts that amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward for over five years. And we want to thank our show sponsors who helped to make this happen. Armis, First Health Advisors, Meditech, Transparent, and You Perform. We thank them for investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Now, on to our show. Hello, I'm Sue Shade, Principal at Starbridge Advisors and one of the hosts for the Town Hall Show at This Week Health. Today, my guest is William Walders, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Baycare Health System in Florida. William has been there since April after serving as SVP and CIO for IDN Operations at Health First the previous four years. I'm really looking forward to hearing about William's challenges and lessons transitioning to a new health system and what he and his team are currently focusing on. So welcome, William. Thanks, Sue. I'm super excited to be here. Great. This will be good. Let's start by having you briefly introduce yourself and tell us about Baycare Health. Yeah, absolutely. So you did a good job of it. So William Walders, Chief Information Officer at Baycare. Baycare is a 16 hospital health system, about six, a little over $6 billion in revenue, all aspects of healthcare, ambulatory hundreds of provider practices, hundreds of physicians, as well as our 16 hospitals. Growing, actually, adding a standalone children's hospital we just announced. I'm really excited about that and what that means to the community, as well as expanding into a new county, North Manatee County. Most people know Manatee as probably Sarasota, kind of the county just south of Tampa. So really excited about the growth at BayCare. We've been an entity or a health system now for since the late 90s. Disparate hospitals came together, like I think many, many health systems do, and, and really proud of that tradition, that contribution to the community, and really being the largest health system in the region. So because of that, we, we get to do some amazing things. I'm sure we'll talk about some of those today. Great. Great. How about telling us about some of your current priorities that you're working on? And I know you've only been there, what, now six months? Yeah. Um, and, and you've you know, got your next year laid out pretty well. I do. So. It's always a priority for me to be what I've always called being brilliant at the basics. Uh, I spent 22 years in the Navy, and it was a mantra we adopted in the Navy sometime in the early 2000s, and it just made sense. It made sense in all aspects of my life. I, I've got a 17-year-old son now, and I would tell him 10 years ago to be brilliant at the basics, right? Show up on time, be courteous, be kind. And it's surprising, like, when you think about it in that perspective, how important that really is, right? So from an IT perspective, we call it IS here, so I'll probably use uh, those terms interchangeably. It's great customer service, keeping the systems up, patched, operational, secure, right? Those are the basic elements that, that really are the foundation of what good IT work is. So that is certainly priority. The best part, you know, inheriting this IS shop from Tim Thompson, who's a well-established leader, and CIO in our world uh, was probably the easiest transition I've ever made. I've always had to inherit something broken. When I was a, took over Walter Reed, it was no secret. In fact, it was on the front page of the Washington Post at the time when I took over around some of the issues it had. My prior employer as well came in there to fix the culture, fix sustainability operations. They had a significant issue prior to my arrival of downtimes that lasted multiple weeks, et cetera. So coming here, start being brilliant at the basics. We were there. So some of the other priorities we're looking at, we're looking to grow and grow smartly. Baycare has 560 days cash on hand. Last report I saw, which we get daily. And if you think about what that means, yeah. um, it's, it gives us quite a war chest, right? Second most viable health system, according to JP Morgan and all the, the Fitch, Moody's, S&P. So with our new leadership, our new CEO coming in exactly a year ago, she wants to grow. She wants to spend some of that war chest smartly, smart growth, smart things around innovation. So that's why I'm here. And really doing assessment of what we had, where we're growing has been part of this first six months. So you're going to see a lot of things from Baycare around the innovation front, focusing largely on a couple key themes, reducing the total cost of care, right? It's no secret 
that healthcare is getting more and more expensive. So we're looking at technologies to do exactly that, bend that cost curve, uh, in particular around labor. A lot of people have been doing this, uh, nursing labor, other labor, but getting folks to operate the top of their license, reducing low value work. So a lot of themes there. A lot around data. We, we have a lot of data. We do it well, but really enabling that. And I can use all the buzzwords here, self-service BI, citizen data scientists, but, but meaning it, right? Putting data in the hands of our 30,000 team members to, to mm -hmm. help with their job. Not only does it do great things for those team members, but it frees up my staff from building simple dashboards 90% of their time and, mm -hmm. and doing pivoting data. I, I joke, if I could get every director and above to know how to use a pivot table, I'd probably free up a, a significant portion of our IS team's time on building dashboards and manipulating some of those simple things. We'll get there working on some data literacy, working on tools to now and enable that. Uh, and then the last thing, is informatics. You'll have seen we just appointed for the first time a, a formal chief nursing information officer, really taking the informatics discipline to what it should be, growing that smartly. That'll be a common theme about smart growth. And then really leveraging the power of those informatics relationships with workflows, with productivity, with trust, faith, and transparency to our clinical partners, of which we have a great relationship today, but just further building on that. Excellent. I love your brilliant at the basics mantra. You said that came yeah. from the Navy days. It did. Yeah. If you Google it, you'll find a, a couple Navy white papers. It's like someone should have wrote a book on this. Like anyone listening, I'm good at talking horrible at like putting all that thought to paper sometimes. Like I'd, I'd love to ghost write it with you. <laughs> okay. And instilling it in your kids. That's a good one too. Yeah. It's a good parenting mantra. It's very simple. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about innovation and some of the areas that you're, where you think yeah. you're pushing the envelope. So can you expand, you talked about one of the themes being reducing the total cost of care, and you talked some about the importance of technology. Any particular things in that area that you want to comment on? Yeah, I think a lot of the augmenting the nursing talent is table stakes these days. I'll talk about telenursing, virtual ICU. We've been doing that for decades, having command center construct to monitor that. We've never called it that. We've never celebrated it like, like a lot of folks do. So that helped during the labor crisis that occurred a couple of years ago, in particular with premium labor. It's no different now. So we're looking some simple things, environmental services. We're putting technology in place to automate those processes where you would go into our cafeterias that would now be open 22 hours a day, vice 14, and just grab your food and leave right? Using technology to, to do that, to charge your either employee account, your badge or your credit card. Uh, and in some of our communities, this cafeteria is the only, I shouldn't say the only place, but a common place folks come for meals, regardless of if they're a patient or guest of a patient. Mm -hmm. Other things around reducing low value work and everywhere, you know, automating simple processes and technologies. We made a press release on it so I can talk about it. Voice, AI, and I struggle with the term AI at times <laughs> because my vacuum now says it's AI. Five years ago, it said it had floor sensing technology. Today, it's AI because it has floor sensing technology. Um, but true think, AI. You branded AI, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But true AI where through generative, implemented to the EAR, EHR with voice, a bone conducting headset, piloting it now but and building it and co-developing with a partner putting the sweat equity in their IP, co-developing with an investment on our side from a grant perspective when this thing is successful. But imagine this, your nurse walks into a room or a nurse walks into a room, he or she does a verbal assessment through this bone conducting headset that documents everything into the chart. But more than that, which seems to be table stakes these days with some of the technology, it then does decision support saying you missed a step or based off what I just heard, this is a sepsis risk or et cetera. So we're really excited about that technology, that co-development effort with a partner and where that will go. A lot of health systems do this with co-development, with kind of taking some chances with things that aren't quite baked yet. That's where this one lies, but we're seeing some early indication and early partnership that uh, this could be a game changer for us. So that's, that's a good example. We have many others. We've got a whole innovation arm, a brilliant gentleman by the name of Craig Anderson, who has a great team that gets to go hunt these things. We joke he's got the best job at Baycare. And then he, he and I collaborate and, and actually implement them. Welcome to This Week Health, where every morning is an opportunity to transform your day with the power of health IT knowledge. Dive into our diverse podcasts on Spotify or Apple Music, featuring shows like Today and Keynote, bringing you insights from the forefront of healthcare technology. 
but there's more. Our daily insight emails deliver the latest health IT news directly to your inbox, ensuring you're always one step ahead. And for those on the go moments, our weekly clip notes summarize key points from our content, making it easier to stay informed, engaged, and aware of what's going on in the industry. And don't forget to visit our revamped website, especially the news section at This Week Health News. It's your curated hub for the most relevant news selected and summarized for your convenience. This Week Health is more than a platform. It's your daily partner in navigating the ever evolving world of health IT. Subscribe, follow, and become a part of a community that's shaping the future of healthcare. This Week Health, where your journey into health IT excellence begins every day. Excellent. Okay. We first spoke a couple of years ago when I was the CIO, interim CIO at Boston Children's Hospital. And I remember reaching out to you because there was a startup company we were talking to and you were working with them and I wanted to kind of pick your brain. And we both know that learning from our colleagues in the health IT community is one of the things that we do and is very valuable. Are there any things that you've reached out to colleagues about in your first six months in Baycare as a new organization for you? We help each other. I think that network's essential. I remember the conversation you and I had with that great company who's still doing great things. So yeah, I would have I talked about my only Cerner experience, I shouldn't say only, was with the DoD. I spent 10 years kind of evaluating Cerner and Epic, then implementing it in the Pacific Northwest for the first three hospitals, but didn't have a ton of optimization or operationalizing it experience. Thankfully, I have an amazing team of 700 people who know it well. But in the early days, I reached out to folks like Craig, Joel Vango, others who had Bennett Cerner shops, and just to kind of build back some of those relationships, understand kind of where the directions were going, in particular with where Cerner, now Oracle Health, was at the mm -hmm. time. So that was one. Another one around data, um, kind of understanding the healthy intent aspect of similar around Cerner, but how our data ontology was. And then we all reach out around new technologies. Again, we're looking, we have ultimately made a selection with RPM. So kind of vetting a couple of the remote patient monitoring partners. Uh, but I'm not kidding when I say every day. There is not a day that goes by except maybe some weekends. And then we're talking about soccer or football. We're not chatting with, I think it's about 28 CIOs. So. Great. Well, I, I know in those roles, you don't have to feel alone <laughs> because of that network you can reach out to. So tell me about your move from Health First to Baycare, some of the differences in the roles and what were you were looking for in making this move? Because I think you probably had broader operational responsibilities outside of IT in your previous role? I did, yeah. It was a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, about a year into my CIO tenure, our COO retired and we kind of chunked off parts of the operations. I got supply chain, the PMO, clinical engineering, retained IS. I think I'm missing something uh, across the entire IDN. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you brought me here a year ago to kind of fix IT as a CIO. Like, gosh, yes, I'll take it. And it was great. I got to do a lot of great things, but learned a lot, certainly around supply chain things. here. I think as as CIOs, we tend to shake our fists at supply chain sometimes around procurement. We could do it better if you don't have that ability to influence, directly influence supply chain. There I didn't. Here I do. So anyway, it was unique. I'll be candid. I wasn't looking until about a year ago. There were some big jobs out there about a year ago. I got a couple of those calls and I was very transparent with my leadership who hated the idea of me looking. And they, and they said, why are you looking? And someone told me this. It might have been Bill, actually, because I might have been in Naples around the same time. And he's like, hey, when you play baseball and the Yankees call, you try out. <laughs> and the Yankees had called. The Yankees thing didn't work out for a couple of reasons. But uh, at some point, Baycare did shortly after that. Born and raised in Tampa. I had always joked I was trying to get back to Tampa. I got close on the other coast of Florida. And uh, Baycare had this amazing brand. Tim is well-respected. Everyone knew how well that IT shop was governed and structured and resourced. All my family's in Tampa. So I'm like, you know what? I'll take the call and, yeah. and did. And then the best thing, and I joke with Tim and Stephanie, our CEO about this. I think the best thing that happened is a, I was 30 minutes early, blame the military for that. And they parked me in the lobby and I'm staring at the wall for 30 minutes. Beautiful lobby lit up in this beautiful white tile with blue light were the five key tenets of Baycare. And it said, trust, respect, dignity, excellence, responsibility, right? And I was in a culture for 22 years that every morning you woke up and you said these words as a requirement, right? Honor, courage, commitment. You went through the Navy, Sailor's Creed. You really represented that. So 
I was like, let's see. As part of, we interview them as much as they interview us. Mm -hmm. And boy, do they exhibit those five core values. And oh my gosh, the culture. If I had to pick one word as to why I left an amazing team at a prior organization. If you saw my LinkedIn when I left, it brought tears to my eyes and still does when I read some of those Again, comments. Yes. Exceptional team. Uh, but it was culture. I could impact the culture I had at the IT team. In fact, that's why I was brought there. But the culture here is, and I'm reticent to say that for any of my Navy alum who are watching, but it surpasses my 22 years of Naval culture where, you know, you took a bullet for the guy or gal to your left and to your right. So uh, I could talk for hours on it. I should write a white paper about it. And it's, you'll, you won't meet any of the 30,000 people at Baker who don't say the exact same thing. So. Inspiring. Very inspiring. And you you referenced the Navy a couple of times in those comments. Thank you for your service. I know you served, what, 22 years in the Navy? Um, I did. It was an honor, honor to serve. I uh, Two very different careers as a nuclear engineer for eight years doing electronics and fire control, weapons kind of stuff on a submarine. And then I crossed over at the remaining 14 doing the exact same job I do today, just at hospitals across the globe. Got it. Got it. So you've talked a little bit about that, the mantra, brilliant at the basics. Anything else you want to comment on in terms of what you have brought forward from your military career into the private sector? Yeah, I think a lot of folks have a hard time transitioning. In fact, I brought more private sector into the military career, I think, than I took vice versa. And I never forget interviewing, gosh, six years ago. And everybody said, you know, how hard is it going to be to, to walk into an organization and not be able to bark orders at people and they just do it? <laughs> and, and I joked, I was like, have you ever worked in the government? Like uh, postal workers or government employees and not to disparage postal workers or the IRS, right? They, w there's a certain moniker around government employees. I had 300 government employees who were a collective bargaining union. If I barked orders at them, I'd have been in trouble. <laughs> and so I have a lot of veterans, but I don't. Besides being brilliant at the basics, and I'll continue to say that, but the courtesy, showing up on time, being on time for meetings, valuing other people's time, those are some of the foundational elements I think you learn in corporate culture and it's mirrored. The best thing that happened to me shortly into my transitioning to military health was meeting a bunch of military veterans like the Drex, the Fords of the world, the Rusty Yeagers, who told me that, hey, it's no different. Come with us. <laughs> we will help you be better at your military job by taking traditional commercial or civilian, we'd call it, methodologies into your hospitals. And those hospitals were run no different. And that was the hardest culture shock. I was on a submarine, deployed 90% of the time. And when I was home, a third of that time you always spent on the submarine, I was not taking that level of commitment to the hospital I was now. I was like, hey, we go home at four o'clock, right? Like, and I'd be there till nine. And everybody's like, are you crazy? So anyway, it's... I think I answered your question in a garrulous way in regards to just similar but different and all good, right? The diversity, the variety. Just before this, I spoke to our, we had 12 new folks and about every two weeks I speak to, we have an IS orientation meeting. It was so amazing to see the diversity. About a third were veterans, a third were from other countries. It's just so great to see that. So I think that's the other thing now that I think about it is diversity. I was a Florida boy in a big town in Florida, but for 22 years, I had no control for the most part of who was who were my peers, who my boss was. And I went all over the world. I lived in, in three continents, Japan, Spain, other places. And you really get exposed to a lot in a short period of time, a lot from a work career perspective, but a lot from a people and culture perspective, which I think allows you to be a better team member with your staff and really empathize and understand different perspectives. Right. And it sounds like you hire a lot of veterans and I would encourage our peers to do the same. Yeah, we hire a lot of, I don't single out veterans, we hire a lot of diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I think it came up. I think more people are like reluctant veterans. I, I don't start with that by any means. And I mentioned it this morning as part of my bio and others did. I don't know that, that others would have, but yeah, I appreciate the, the perspective and, and gratitude. Great. Last question for you. And you might say AI, you might say something else, but what technology are you keeping an eye on that you think will have more of an impact on healthcare in five years than it's having today? Man, five years, gosh. There's no one quote, can predict five years, right? Yeah, there's a quote, and I love that, you know, we underestimate what happens in the next five years, but overestimate what's going to happen in two. That's a good you one. Know, I love answering this question with the following. Like, it's not a technology, it's adoption of technology, right? So I asked this question, and I did a panel a couple nights ago, and I don't know that I was asked this question, but something similar. And I've asked a room a couple hundred people, I said, who uses telehealth, this device, 
to see their doctor. And I think folks lie to me because about half the room raised their hand. But if you look at the statistics, it's around 25% use it for primary care and anywhere between 10 and 16% for secondary. And I'm like, this is the problem. Like we've got all this technology. No one is using it, right? We complain about access to care, but I can get you a doctor right now on big care anywhere. Uh, or you can call and I'll get you one in three weeks. But for whatever reason, we've got this desire to want to drive for 20 minutes, park, sit in a waiting room for 30 minutes, reading three-year-old magazines for the doctor to see us. So I think adoption of technology is, is what I'd love to answer there. It is no secret and surprise that AI generative AI is a spectrum. Assistive AI or what I augmented intelligence is what I love, what I'd love for AI to stand for, right? The ability for and I hate AI, I hate and love hate AI, as I mentioned earlier, but the ability for some tool, we'll call it AI, to augment our intelligence and our day-to-day -day interaction. If that's me with email and spreadsheets and PowerPoint, building those for me, augmenting them, getting them close, and then I tune them. If it's for a physician to make better clinical decision support in healthcare, if it's for a nurse to do some of the things I told you about around documentation, around improving workflows, that will it's a no-brainer. That is going to be the thing. There's a lot of, again, there's brilliant the basics things that have to occur. How about we adopt it? <laughs> How about we are literate in it, right? Advocacy, literacy. How about we have the foundational elements to do it? Infrastructure, mm -hmm. data, right? All these things are fed by data. If you don't have the data fabric in place, if you're not grounding these tools in something that is known, good, reliable, that you believe in, those are the things we need to do in the next five years to make sure that prediction comes true. So. Great. Great answer. I'd love to follow up on some of the things you just said, but I think we're at time. Is there anything else that you want to highlight before we close? Oh, I think I covered it. I mean, super excited to to be here. It's the best job I've ever had. And that's hard to say, knowing uh, my okay. history, knowing a lot of the people I've had an opportunity to serve with and work with. Baycare is not the quietest, largest health system it once was. Uh, under new leadership, with some changes. You're going to hear a lot more exciting things from us. I, I encourage all of you to, to follow us on LinkedIn, to engage with us and our other leaders in the organization. You're going to see a lot of great things come from Baycare. Excellent. It sounds like more than just the honeymoon period, William. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I somehow fell in love, got engaged. Honeymoon is over. We're now at kind of 20, 30 year anniversary, I feel like, but now it's good. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for talking to me today. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely, Sue, always a pleasure. I love this show. I love hearing what workers and leaders on the front lines are doing. And we wanna thank our hosts who continue to support the community by developing this great content. If you wanna support This Week Health, the best way to do that is to let someone else know that you are listening to the show and clue them into it. We have two channels, This Week Health Conference and This Week Health Newsroom. You can check them out today and you can find them wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find them on our website, thisweekhealth.com and subscribe there as well. We also wanna thank our show partners, Armis, First Health Advisors, Meditech, Transparent, and You Perform for investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Thanks for listening. That's all for now. <laughs>